Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I wanted to return to the Kabbalah. I still have a tough time understanding the Kabbalah, the system, and how to use the Kabbalah to better understand the forces of life around me. And I've undergone some study in this. There's a previous episode that we did with Manly P. Hall's discussion of it, but I felt still a little bit empty with an understanding of it. It is complicated. And there are some texts out there that just make it too difficult to understand. One particular place that I've found some answers is Dion Fortune and her discussion of the mystical Kabbalah. She discusses it as a spiritual system that brings together many of the other systems and is a method of understanding the forces of the universe that holds great power. So I wanted to go over some of what she taught in her book, The Mystical Kabbalah, to expand my understanding of this. While I will say I'll never fully understand it uh, without further education, it is something that could require years of proper research to fully understand. But I feel I'm ready, and this is another place for us to start. There's some great channels that are much more detailed about the Kabbalah. This is just one source to get a beginning understanding. Dion Fortune was an incredibly credible occult teacher and researcher that documented a number of powerful rituals and was sort of a go-between with the Golden Dawn, discussing elements related to a number of magical processes coming from a scientific point of view. Her book, The Cosmic Doctrine, is mind-blowing. I may return to that someday. And until then, we will start with this particular exploration. She begins by saying, very few students of occultism know anything at all about the fountainhead whence their tradition springs. Many of them do not even know there is a Western tradition. Scholarship is baffled by the international blinds and defenses which initiates both ancient and modern have wrapped themselves about and concludes that the few fragments of a literature which have come down to us are medieval forgeries. They would be greatly surprised if they knew that these fragments, supplemented by manuscripts that have never been allowed to pass out of the hands of initiates and completed by an oral tradition, are handed down in schools of initiation to this day and are used as the basis of the practical work of the yoga of the West. The adepts of those races whose evolutionary destiny is to conquer the physical plane have evolved a yoga technique of their own, which is adapted to their special problems and peculiar needs. This technique is based upon the well-known but little understood Kabbalah, the wisdom of Israel. It may be asked why it is the Western nations should go to the Hebrew culture for their mystical tradition. The answer to this question would be readily understood by those who are acquainted with the esoteric theory concerning races and sub-races. Everything must have a source. Cultures do not spring out of nothing. The seed bearers of each new phase of culture must of necessity arise within the preceding culture. No one can deny that Judaism was the matrix of the European spiritual culture when they recall the fact that Jesus and Paul were both Jews. No race except the Jewish race could possibly have served as the stock upon which the new dispensation was to be grafted, because no other race was monotheistic. Pantheism and polytheism had their day, and a new and more spiritual culture was due. The Christian races owe their religion to the Jewish culture as surely as the Buddhist races of the East owe theirs to the Hindu culture. The mysticism of Israel supplies the foundation of modern Western occultism. It forms the theoretical basis upon which all ceremonial is developed. Its famous glyph, the Tree of Life, is the best meditation symbol we possess because it is the most comprehensive. It is not my intention to write a historical study of the sources of the Kabbalah, but rather to show the uses that are made of it by modern students of the mysteries. 
For although the roots of our system are in tradition, there is no reason why we should be hidebound by tradition. A technique that is being actually practiced is a growing thing, for the experience of each enriches it and becomes part of the common heritage. It is not necessarily incumbent upon us to do certain things or hold certain ideas because the rabbis who lived before Christ had certain views. The world has moved on since those days and we are under a new dispensation, but what was true in principle then will be true in principle now and of value to us. The modern Kabbalist is the heir of the ancient Kabbalist and he must reinterpret doctrine and reformulate method in the light of present dispensation if the heritage he has received is to be of any practical value to him. I do not claim that the modern Kabbalistic teachings as I have learnt them are identical with those of the pre-Christian rabbis, but I claim that they are legitimate descendants thereof and the natural development therefrom. The nearer the source, the purer the stream. In order to discover first principles, we must go to the fountainhead, but a river receives many tributaries in the course of its flow, and these needs are not necessarily to be polluted. If we want to discover whether they are pure or not, we compare them with the pristine stream, and if they pass the test, they may well be permitted to mingle with the main body of waters and swell their strength. So it is with a tradition that which is not antagonistic will be assimilated. We must always test the purity of a tradition by reference to first principles, but we shall equally judge the vitality of a tradition by its power to assimilate. It is only a dead faith which remains uninfluenced by contemporary thought. The original stream of Hebraic mysticism has received many tributaries. We see its rise among the nomad star worshippers of Chaldea, where Abraham in his tent among his flocks hears the voice of God. But Abraham has a shadowy background in which vast forms move half seen. The mysterious figure of a great priest king, born without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, administers to him the first Eucharistic feast of bread and wine after the battle with the kings in the valley, the sinister kings of Edom, who ruled ere there was a king in Israel whose kingdoms are in balanced force. Generation by generation we trace the intercourse of the princes of Israel with the priest kings of Egypt, Abraham and Jacob, went thither. Joseph and Moses were intimately associated with the court of the royal adepts. When we read of Solomon sending to Haram, king of Tyre, for men and materials to aid in the building of the temple, we know that the famous Tyrian mysteries must have profoundly influenced the Hebrew esotericism. When we read of Daniel being educated in the palaces of Babylon, we know that the wisdom of the Magi must have been accessible to Hebrew Illuminati. This ancient mystical tradition of the Hebrews possessed three literatures, the books of the Law and the Prophets, which are known to us as the Old Testament, the Talmud, or collection of learned commentaries thereon, and the Kabbalah, or mystical interpretation thereof. Of these three, the ancient rabbis say, the first is the body of the tradition, the second is the rational soul, and the third is its immortal spirit. Ignorant men may with a prophet read the first, learned men study the second, but the wise meditate upon the third. It is a strange thing that Christian exegesis has never sought the keys to the Old Testament in the Kabbalah. And one reason I'm very interested in this is that Neville Goddard's reading of the Bible comes from a Kabbalistic interpretation as taught to him from his mentor, Abdullah. And you see it in all of his lectures, especially when interpreting words as numbers. Fortune goes on to say that no student will ever make any progress in spiritual development who flits from system to system first using some new thought affirmations, then some yoga breathing exercises and meditation postures, and following these by an attempt at the mystical methods of prayer. Hmm, sounds like me a little bit. <laughs> well, each of these systems has its value, but that value can only be realized if the system is carried out in its entirety. They are the calisthenics of consciousness and aim at gradually developing the powers of the mind. The value does not lie in the prescribed exercises as ends in themselves, but in the powers 
that will be developed if they are persevered with. If we intend to take our occult studies seriously and make of them anything more than desultory light reading, we must choose our system and carry it out faithfully until we arrive, if not at its ultimate goal, at any rate, at definite practical results and a permanent enhancement of consciousness. After this has been achieved, we may not without advantage experiment with the methods that have been developed upon other paths and build up an eclectic technique and philosophy therefrom. But the student who sets out to be an eclectic before he has made himself an expert will never be anything more than a dabbler. Two, whoever has any practical experience of the different methods of spiritual development knows that the method must fit the temperament and that it must also be adapted to the grade of development of the student. Westerners, especially such as prefer the occult to the mystic path, often come seeking initiation at a stage of spiritual development, which an Eastern guru would consider exceedingly immature. Any method that is to be available for the West must have in its lower grades a technique which can be used as a stopping stone by these undeveloped students to ask them to rise immediately to metaphysical heights is useless in the case of the great majority and prevents a start from being made. For a system of spiritual development to be applicable in the West, it must fulfill certain well-defined requirements. To begin with, its elementary technique must be such that it is readily grasped by minds that have in them nothing of the mystic. Secondly, the forces it brings to bear to stimulate the development of the higher aspects of consciousness must be sufficiently powerful and concentrated to penetrate the relatively dense vehicles of the average Westerner who makes nothing whatever of subtle vibrations. Thirdly, as few Europeans following a racial dharma of material development have either the opportunity or the inclination to lead the life of a recluse, the forces employed must be handled in such a way that they can be made available during the brief periods that the modern man or woman can, at the commencement of the path, snatch from their daily avocations to give to their pursuit. They must, that is to say, be handled by a technique which enables them to be readily concentrated and equally readily dispersed, because it is not possible to maintain these high psychic tensions while living the hard-driving life of a citizen of a European city. Experience proves with unfailing regularity that the methods of psychic development which are effectual and satisfactory for the recluse produce neurotic conditions and breakdowns in the person who pursues them while compelled to endure the strain of modern life. It is by means of formula that the occultist selects and concentrates the forces he wishes to work with. These formula are based upon the Kabbalistic tree of life and whatever system he may be working, whether he may be assuming the god forms of Egypt or evoking the inspiration of Incas with chant and dance, he has the diagram of the tree at the back of his mind. It is in the symbolism of the tree that Western initiates are drilled, and it supplies the essential ground plan of classification to which all other systems can be related. The ray upon which the Western aspirant works has manifested itself through many different cultures and developed a characteristic technique in each. The modern initiate works a synthetic system, sometimes using an Egyptian, a Greek, or even a Druidic method for different methods are best suited for different purposes and conditions. In all cases, however, the operations he designs are strictly related to the paths of the tree of life, which he is the master. If he possesses the grade which corresponds to the Sephira Netzach, he can work with the manifestations of the force of that aspect of the Godhead, distinguished by the Kabbalists by the name Tetragrammaton Elohim, in whatever system he may select. In the Egyptian system, he will be the Isis of nature, in the Greek Aphrodite, in the Nordic Preya, in the Druidic Keridwen. In other words, he possesses the powers of the sphere of Venus in whatever traditional system he may be using. Having attained a grade in one system, he has access to the equivalent grades of all the other systems of his tradition. But although he may use these other systems as occasion serves, experience proves that the Kabbalah supplies the best groundwork and the best system upon which to train a student before the experiments begin with the pagan systems. 
The Kabbalah is essentially monotheistic. The potencies it classifies are always regarded as the messengers of God and not his fellow workers. This principle enforces the concept of a centralized government of the cosmos and of the grip of the divine law upon the whole manifestation, a very necessary principle with which to imbue any student of the arcane forces. It is the purity, sanity, and clarity of the Kabbalistic concepts as resumed in the formula of the Tree of Life, which makes glyph such an admirable one for the meditations that exalt consciousness and justify us in calling the Kabbalah the Yoga of the West. The Method of the Kabbalah Speaking of the method of the Kabbalah, one of the ancient rabbis says that an angel coming down to earth would have to take on human form in order to converse with men. The curious symbol system known to us as the tree of life is an attempt to reduce to diagrammatic form every force and factor in the manifested universe and the soul of man, to correlate them one to another and reveal them spread out as on a map, so that the relative positions of each unit can be seen and the relations between them traced. In brief, the tree of life is a compendium of science, psychology, philosophy, and theology. The student of the Kabbalah goes to work in exactly the opposite way to the student of natural science. The latter builds up synthetic concepts. The former analyzes abstract concepts. It goes without saying, however, that before a concept can be analyzed, it must first be assembled. Someone must have thought out the principles that are resumed in the symbol, which is the object of meditation of the Kabbalist. Who then were the first Kabbalists who built up the whole scheme? The rabbis are unanimous upon this point. They were angels. In other words, it was beings of another order of creation than humanity who gave the chosen people their Kabbalah. Now, side note. Check out the episode I did by Quo and Ra discussing Yahweh. And the implication is that Higher density beings may have been part of the introduction of this particular culture. To the modern mind, this may seem as absurd a statement as the doctrine that babies are found under gooseberry bushes, Fortune says. But if we study the many mystical systems of comparative religion, we find that all the Illuminati are in agreement upon this point. All men and women who have had practical experience of the spiritual life tell us they are taught by divine beings. We shall be very foolish if we altogether disregard such a cloud of witnesses, especially those of us who never had any personal experience of the higher states of consciousness. There are some psychologists who will tell us that the angels of the Kabbalists and the gods and the Manus of other systems are our own repressed complexes. There are others with less limited outlook who will tell us that these divine beings are the latent capacities of our own higher selves. To the devotional mystic, this is not a point of any great moment. He gets his results, and that is all he cares about. But the philosophical mystic, in other words, the occultist, thinks the matter out and arrives at certain conclusions. These conclusions, however, can only be understood when we know what we mean by reality and have a clear line of demarcation between the subjective and the objective. Anyone who is trained in philosophical method knows that this is asking a good deal. The Indian schools of metaphysics have most elaborate and intricate systems of philosophy which attempt to define these ideas and render them thinkable. And though generations of seers have given their lives to the task, the concept still remains so abstract that it is only after a long course of discipline called yoga in the East that the mind is able to apprehend them at all. The Kabbalist goes to work in a different way. He does not attempt to make the mind rise up on the wings of metaphysics into the rarefied air of abstract reality. He formulates a concrete symbol that the eye can see and lets it represent the abstract reality that no untrained human mind can grasp. It is exactly the same principle as algebra. Let X represent the unknown quantity. Let Y represent the half of X and let Z represent something we know. If we begin to experiment with Y to find out its relation to Z, and in what proportions, 
It soon ceases to be entirely unknown. We have learned something at any rate about it. And if we are sufficiently skillful, we may in the end be able to express in terms of Z. Then we shall begin to understand X. There are a great many symbols which are used as objects of meditation. The cross in Christendom, the god forms in the Egyptian system, phallic symbols in other faiths, these symbols are used by the uninitiated as a means of concentrating the mind and introducing it into certain thoughts, calling up certain associated ideas and stimulating certain feelings. The initiate, however, uses a symbol system differently. He uses it as an algebra by means of which he will read the secrets of unknown potencies. In other words, he uses the symbol as a means of guiding thought out into the unseen and incomprehensible. How does he do this? He does it by using a composite symbol, a symbol which is an unattached unit, would not serve his purpose. In contemplating such a composite symbol as the tree of life, he observes there are definite relations between its parts. There are some parts of which he knows something, there are others of which he can intuit something, or more crudely make a guess, reasoning from first principles. The mind leaps from one known to another known, and in so doing traverses certain distances. Metaphorically speaking, it is like a traveler in the desert who knows the situation of two oases and makes a forced march between them. He would never have dared to push out into the desert from the first oasis if he had not known the location of the second. But the end of the journey, he not only knows much more about the characteristics of the second oasis, but he has also observed the country lying between them. This making forced marches from oasis to oasis, backwards and forwards across the desert. He gradually explores it. Nevertheless, the desert is incapable of supporting life. So it is with the Kabbalistic system of notation. The things it renders are unthinkable. And yet the mind, tracking from symbol to symbol, manages to think about them. And although we have to be content to see it in a glass darkly, yet we have every reason to hope that ultimately we shall see face to face. And even as we are known for, the human mind grows by exercise. And that which was at first unthinkable as mathematics to the child who cannot manage his sums finally comes within the range of our realization. By thinking about a thing, we build concepts of it. It is said that thought grew out of language, not language out of thought, that words are to thought, symbols are to intuition. Curious as it may seem, the symbol precedes the elucidation. That is why we declare that the Kabbalah is a growing system, not a historic monument. There is more to be got out of Kabbalistic symbols today than there was in the time of the old dispensation because our mental content is richer in ideas. How much more, for instance, does the Sefer Yassad, wherein work the forces of growth and reproduction, mean to the biologist than the ancient rabbi? Everything that has to do with growth and reproduction is resumed in the sphere of the moon, but this sphere, as represented upon the tree of life, is set about with paths leading to other Sephiroth. Therefore, the biological Kabbalist knows there must be certain definite relationships between the forces subsumed in Yesod and those represented by the symbols assigned to these paths. Brooding over these symbols, he gets glimpses of relationships that do not reveal themselves when the material aspect of things is considered. And when he comes to work these out in the material of his studies, he finds therein are hidden important clues. And so upon the tree, one thing leads to another explanation of hidden causes arising out of proportions and relations of the various individual symbols composing this mighty synthetic glyph. Each symbol, moreover, admits of interpretation upon the different planes, and although its astrological associations can be related to the gods of any pantheon, thus opening up vast new fields of implications in which the mind ranges endlessly, symbol leading on to symbol, in an unbroken chain of associations, symbol confirming symbol as the many branching threads gather themselves together into a synthetic glyph once more. And each symbol capable of interpretation in terms of whatever plane the mind may be functioning upon. This mighty, all-embracing glyph of the soul of man and the universe.
by virtue of its logical association of symbols, evokes images in the mind. But these images are not randomly evolved, but follow along well-defined association tracks in the universal mind. The symbol of the tree is to the universal mind what the dream is to the individual ego. It is a glyph synthesized from subconsciousness to represent the hidden forces. The universe is really a thought form projected from the mind of God. The Kabbalistic tree might be likened to a dream arising from the subconsciousness of God and dramatizing the subconscious content of deity. In other words, if the universe is the conscious end product of the mental activity of the Logos, the tree is the symbolic representation of the raw material of the divine consciousness and of the processes whereby the universe came into being. But the tree applies not only to the macrocosm, but to the microcosm, which as all occultists realize is a replica in miniature. It is for this reason that divination is possible that little understood and much maligned art has for its philosophical basis the system of correspondences represented by symbols. The correspondences between the soul of man and the universe are not arbitrary, but arise out of developmental identities. Certain aspects of consciousness were developed in response to certain phases of evolution and therefore embody the same principles, consequently they react to the same influences. A man's soul is like a lagoon connected with the sea by a submerged channel. Although to all outward seeming it is landlocked, nevertheless its water level rises and falls with the tides of the sea because of the hidden connections. So it is with human consciousness there is a subconscious connection between each individual soul and the world soul deep hidden in the most primitive depths of the subconsciousness. And in consequence, we share in the rise and fall of the cosmic tides. Each symbol upon the tree represents a cosmic force or factor. When the mind concentrates upon it, it comes into touch with that force. In other words, a surface channel, a channel in consciousness, has been made between the conscious mind of the individual and a particular factor in the world soul. And through this channel, the waters of the ocean pour into the lagoon. The aspirant who uses the tree as his meditation symbol establishes point by point the union between his soul and the world soul. This results in a tremendous access of energy to the individual soul. It is this which endows it with magical powers. But just as the universe must be ruled by God, so must the many-sided soul of man be ruled by its God, the spirit of man. The higher self must dominate its universe or there will be unbalanced force each factor will rule its own aspect and they will war among themselves then do we have the rule of the kings of edom whose kingdoms are unbalanced force thus do we see in the tree a glyph of the soul of man and the universe and in the legends associated with it the history of the evolution of the soul and the way of initiation the unwritten Kabbalah. The point of view from which I approach the Holy Kabbalah in these pages differs so far as I know from that of all other writers on the subject, for to me it is a living system of spiritual development, not a historical curiosity. Few people, even among those interested in occultism, realize that there is an active esoteric tradition in our midst, handed down in private manuscripts and by mouth to ear. Still fewer know that it is the Holy Kabbalah, the mystic system of Israel, which forms its basis. But where may we look more aptly for our occult inspiration than to the tradition which gave us the Christ? The interpretation of the Kabbalah is not to be found, however, among the rabbis of the outer Israel, who are Hebrews after the flesh, but among those who are the chosen people after the spirit. In other words, the initiates. Neither is the Kabbalah, as I have learnt, a purely Hebraic system, for it has been supplemented during medieval times by much alchemical lore and by the intimate association with it of that most marvelous system of symbolism, the tarot. In my presentation of the subject, therefore, I do not appeal so much to tradition in support of my views as to modern practice among those who make use of the Kabbalah as their method of occult technique. 
It may be alleged against me that the ancient rabbis knew nothing of some of the concepts here set forth. To this I reply that it is hardly to be expected that they should, as these things were not known in their day, but are the work of their successors of the spiritual Israel. For in my part, although I would not willingly mislead anyone concerning the teachings of those of ancient days and upon matters of historical accuracy, stand subject to any correction from any who are better informed than I am in these matters. I care not one jot for the authority of tradition if it hampers the free development of a system of such practical value as the Holy Kabbalah. And I use the work of my predecessors as a quarry whence I fetch the stone to build my city. Neither am I limited to this quarry by any ordinance that I know of, but fetch also cedar from Lebanon and gold from Ophir, if it suits my purpose. Let it be clearly understood, therefore, that I do not say, this is the teaching of the ancient rabbis. Rather, do I say, this is the practice of the modern Kabbalists. For as much more vital matter, for it is a practical system of spiritual unfoldment, it is the yoga of the West. Having thus guarded myself as far as possible against blame for not having done what I never undertook to do, let me now define my own position in the matter of scholarship and general qualifications for the task in hand. So far in actual scholarship goes, I am in the same class as William Shakespeare, having little Latin and less Greek, and of Hebrew only that peculiar portion which is cultivated by occultists, the ability to transliterate unappointed Hebrew script for the purposes of geometric calculations, of any knowledge of Hebrew as a language, I am guiltless. Whether such frank acknowledgement of my deficiencies will serve to disarm criticism, I do not know. No doubt it will be alleged against me, and not without justification, that one so ill-equipped should not have undertaken the task at all. To this I reply, if one saw a man lying injured, should the admitted absence of a medical qualification debar one from going to his assistance and giving him what help one could, pending the arrival of the qualified attention. My work upon the Kabbalah is of the nature of the first aid. I find an invaluable system lying neglected and ill-qualified for the task. One qualification for my task I can plead in justification, however, for the last 10 years I've lived and moved and had my being in the practical Kabbalah. I've used its methods, both subjectively and objectively, till they have become a part of myself, and I know from experience they yield in psychic and spiritual results and their incalculable value as a method of using the mind. It is not required of those who would use the Kabbalah as their yoga that they would acquire any extensive knowledge of the Hebrew language. All they need is to be able to read and write the Hebrew characters. The modern Kabbalah has been pretty thoroughly naturalized in the English language, but it retains and must ever retain all its words of power in Hebrew, which is the sacred language of the West, just as Sanskrit is the sacred language of the East. There are those who have objected to the free employment of the Sanskrit terms in occult literature, and no doubt they will object even more strongly to the employment of Hebrew characters, but their use is unavoidable. For every letter in Hebrew is also a number, and the numbers to which words add up are not only an important clue to their significance, but can also be used to express the relationship existing between different ideas and potencies. According to McGregor Mathers, in the admirable essay which forms the introduction to his book, The Kabbalah, is usually classed under four heads. The practical Kabbalah, which deals with talismanic and ceremonial magic. The dogmatic Kabbalah, which consists of the Kabbalistic literature. The literal Kabbalah, which deals with the use of letters and numbers. The unwritten Kabbalah, which consists of correct knowledge of the manner in which the symbol systems are arranged on the tree of life and concerning which McGregor Mathers says, I may say no more on this point, not even whether I myself have or have not received it. But as this portentous hint is elaborated by the late Mrs. McGregor Mathers in her introduction to the new edition of his book in the following plain spoken words, simultaneously with the publication of the Kabbalah in 1887, he received instructions from his occult teachers to prepare what was eventually to become his esoteric school. It may be justifiable to say that if he did receive the unwritten Kabbalah, it has for some years ceased to be unwritten, for after a quarrel with McGregor Mathers, Alistair Crowley, the well-known author and scholar, published The Lot, 
His books are now rare and hard to come by, and being much valued by the more scholarly of esotericists, their price has gone up out of sight, and they seldom come into the second-hand book market. The breaking of an initiation oath is a serious matter, and a thing that I, for my part, do not care to do, but I admit of no authority that debars me from collecting and collating all available material that has been published upon any subject and interpreting it according to the best of my understanding. In these pages is the system given by Crowley of which I shall avail myself to supplement the points upon which Mathers, Wynne Westcott, and A.E. E. Waite, the principal modern authorities upon the Kabbalah, are silent. The essence of the unwritten Kabbalah lies in the knowledge of the order in which certain sets of symbols are arranged upon the tree of life. This tree, Etz Shein, consists of the ten holy sephiroth, arranged in a particular pattern, and connected by lines which are called the thirty-two paths of the sephir Yetzirah, or divine emanations. Here there exists one of the blinds or traps for the uninitiated in which the ancient rabbis delighted. We find if we count them that there are 22, not 32 paths upon the tree. But for their purpose, the rabbis treated the 10 sephiroth themselves as paths, thus misleading the uninitiated. Thus the first 10 paths of the sephir Yetzirah are assigned to the 10 sephiroth and the following 22 to the actual paths themselves. It will then be seen how the 22 letters of the sephira of the Hebrew alphabet can be associated with the paths without discrepancy or overlapping. With them are also associated the 22 tarot trumps, the Addis or Abadis of Thoth. Concerning the tarot cards, there are three modern authorities of notes, Dr. Incos or Papus, the French writer, Mr. A. E. Waite, and Miss of McGregor Mather's Order of the Golden Dawn, which Crowley published upon his own authority, all three are different. Concerning the system Mr. Waite gives, he himself says there is another method known to initiates. There is reason to suppose that this is a method used by Mathers. Papus disagrees with both these writers in his method, but as his system does violence, many of the correspondences when placed upon the tree, the final test of all systems, and the Mathers-Crowley system fit admirably, I think, we must justly conclude that the latter is the correct traditional order and I propose to adhere to it in these pages. Check out my episode on the tarot as written about by the Law of One Material for supplemental material on the tarot. The Kabbalist further placed upon the paths of the tree the signs of the zodiac, the planets and the elements. Now there are 12 signs, 7 planets and 4 elements making 23 symbols in all. How are these to be fitted onto the 22 paths? Herein is another blind, but the solution is simple. Upon the physical plane we are ourselves in the element of earth. Therefore that symbol does not appear upon the paths which lead into the unseen. Remove this and we are left with 22 symbols, which fit accurately and correctly placed are found to correspond perfectly with the tarot trumps, each elucidating the other in the most remarkable fashion and giving the keys to esoteric astrology and tarot divination. The essence of each faith is to be found in the fact that it connects two of the Sephiroth, and we can only understand its significance by taking into account the nature of the linked spheres upon the tree. But a Sephiroth cannot be understood upon a single plane. It has a fourfold nature. The Kabbalists express this by saying that there are four worlds. Atzaluth, the archetypal world or world of emanations, the divine world. Bria, the world of creation, also called Kursia, the world of thrones. Yetzera, the world of formation and of angels. Asia, the world of action, the world of matter. See McGregor Matthews, the Kabbalah unveiled. The ten holy Sephiroth are held to have its own point of contact with each of the four worlds of the Kabbalists. In the Atzaluthic world, they manifest the ten holy names of God. In other words, the great unmanifest shadowed forth through the three negative veils of existence which hang between the crown, 
declares itself in manifestation as ten different aspects which are represented by the different names used to denote deity in the Hebrew scriptures. These are variously rendered in the authorized version and a knowledge of their true significance and spheres to which they belong enables us to read many of the riddles of the Old Testament. In the Briotic world, the divine emanations are held to manifest through the ten mighty archangels, whose names play such an important part in ceremonial magic. It is the worn and effaced remnants of these words of power that are the barbarous names of evocation of medieval magic, not one letter of which may be changed. Why this is so may readily be seen when we remember that in Hebrew a letter is also a number and the numbers of a name have an important significance. In the Yetzeratic world, the divine emanations manifest not through a single being but through different types of beings which are called the angelic hosts or choirs. The Asiatic world is not, strictly speaking, the world of matter when viewed from the Sephirotic standpoint, but rather the lower astral and etheric planes which together form the background of matter. Upon the physical plane, the divine emanations manifest through what may not inaptly be called the ten mundane chakras, likening these centers of manifestation to the centers that exist in the human body an exact analogy. These chakras are the primum mobile, or first swirlings, the sphere of the zodiac, the seven planets, and the elements taken together, ten in all. It will be seen from the foregoing that each sephira will therefore consist firstly of its mundane chakra, secondly of an angelic host of beings, divas or archons, principalities or powers, according to the terminology used, thirdly an archangelic consciousness or throne, and fourthly a special aspect of the deity, God as he is in his entirety, being hidden behind the negative veils of existence, incomprehensible to unenlightened human consciousness. The Sephiroth may justly be considered macrocosmic, and the paths microcosmic for the Sephiroth connected as they sometimes are in old diagrams by a flash of lightning, which is often depicted as hilted like a fiery sword, represent the successive divine emanations, which constitute creative evolution, whereas the paths represent the successive stages of the unfolding of cosmic realization in human consciousness. In old pictures, a serpent is often depicted as twined about the bows of the tree. This is the serpent, Nekustan, who holdeth his tail in his mouth, the symbol of wisdom and initiation. The coils of this serpent, when correctly arranged upon the tree, cross each of the paths in succession and serve to indicate the order in which they should be numbered. With the help of this glyph, then it is a simple matter to arrange all the tables of symbols in their correct positions upon the tree. Granted that the symbols are given in their correct order in the tables. In certain modern books which rank as authorities upon the subject, the correct order is not given, the writers apparently holding that this should not be revealed to the uninitiated. But as this order is given correctly in certain older books, and for the matter of that, in the Bible itself, and the Kabbalistic literature, there seems to me no point in deliberately misleading students with spurious information. To refuse to divulge anything may be justifiable. How it is possible to justify the handling of misleading statements? No one is going to be persecuted nowadays for their studies in unorthodox sciences. So there can be but one purpose in withholding teaching that relates solely to the theory of the universe and the philosophy arising therefrom and in no way to the methods of practical magic, and that purpose is to retain a monopoly of the knowledge which confers prestige if not power. For my part, I believe that this selfishness and exclusiveness is the bane of the occult movement rather than its safeguard. It is the old sin of retaining the knowledge of God in the hands of the priesthood and denying it to all outside the sacred clan justifiable enough when the people were savages, but unjustifiable in the case of the modern student. But when all is said and done, the desired information can be worked out from existing literature, 
by those who care to take the trouble or purchased plainly set forth by those who can afford high prices for books now rare surely the possession of ample time and ample cash should not be the test of the fitness to obtain the sacred wisdom no doubt i shall expose myself to a shore of abuse from the self constituted guardians of this knowledge who may hold that their precious secrets have been betrayed to this i reply that i am not betraying anything that is secret but collecting that which has already been given to the world and is of a simple and well-known nature when i first had access to certain manuscripts i believed them to be a secret and unknown to the world at large but a wider acquaintance with occult literature has revealed to me that the information is to be found scattered broadcast through it much in fact to which the initiate is sworn to secrecy has been published by mathers and win westcott themselves and as recently as 1926 a new edition of mathers work on the gabala was bought out under the editorship of his widow and in that work will be found most of the tables that i give in these pages all these catalogs of beings were originally given to the world by isaiah ezekiel and various medieval rabbis in any case such ownership as there may be in these ideas is vested in the original author and not any subsequent commentator and that author according to the kabbalah itself is the archangel metatron much that was once common knowledge has been gathered up and confined under the initiate's oath of secrecy it is crowley's jibe at his teachers that they bound him to secrecy with terrible oaths and then confided the hebrew alphabet to his safekeeping the philosophy of the Kabbalah is the esotericism of the West. In it we find such a cosmogony as is found in the stanzas of Zion, which were the basis of Madame Blavatsky's work. Herein she found the framework of traditional doctrine, which she expounded in her great book, The Secret Doctrine. This Kabbalistic cosmogony is the Christian gnosis. Without it, we have an incomplete system in our religion, and it is this incomplete system which has been the weakness of Christianity. The early fathers, in the homely metaphor, threw away the baby with the bathwater. A very cursory acquaintance with the Kabbalah serves to show that here we have the essential keys to the riddles of Scripture in general, and the prophetic books in particular. Is there any good reason why initiates of the present day should put all this knowledge into a secret box and sit upon the lid if they consider that i am wrong to give accurate information upon matters which they consider their private preserve i reply that this is a free country and they are entitled to their opinion the tree of life as cannot too often be emphasized is not so much a system as a method those who formulated it realize the important truth that in order to obtain clarity of vision one must circumscribe the field of vision most philosophers founded their systems upon the absolute but this is a shifting foundation for the human mind can neither define nor grasp the absolute some others try to use a negation for their foundation declaring that the absolute is and must ever be unknowable the kabbalists do neither of these things they content themselves with the saying that the absolute is unknown to the state of consciousness which is normal to human beings for the purposes of their system therefore they draw a veil at a certain point in manifestation not because there is nothing there but because the mind as such must stop there when the human mind has been brought to its highest stage of development and consciousness can detach itself therefrom and as it were stand upon its own shoulders we may be able to penetrate the veils of negative existence as they are called but for all practical purposes we can understand the nature of the cosmos if we are content to accept the veils as philosophical conventions and realize that they correspond to human limitations not to cosmic conditions the origin of things is inexplicable in terms of our philosophy however we push our inquiries back into origins in the world of manifestation we find a preceding existence it is only when we are content to draw the veil of negative existence across the path which leads back to the beginnings that we get a background against which a first cause becomes visible and this cause is not a rootless origin but a first appearance on the plane of manifestation thus far and no farther can the mind go back but we must always remember that different minds go back different distances and that for some the veil is drawn in one place and for others in another 
The ignorance goes no further than the concept of God as an old man with a long white beard who sat on a golden throne and gave orders for creation. The scientist will go back a little further before he is compelled to draw a veil called the ether, and the philosopher will go back yet further before he draws a veil called the absolute. But the initiate will go back furthest of all because he is learnt to do his thinking in symbols, and symbols are to the mind what tools are to the hand, an extended application of its powers. The Kabbalist takes for his starting point Kether, the crown, the first sephirah, which he symbolizes by the figure one unity, and by the point within the circle. From this he traces backward the three veils of negative existence. This is quite a different matter from starting at the absolute and trying to work forwards into evolution. It may not yield immediately accurate and complete knowledge of the origin of all things, but it enables the mind to make a start, and unless we can make a start we have no hope of a finish. The Kabbalist then starts where he can at the first point, that is, within the reach of finite consciousness. Kether is equated with the most transcendent form of God that we can conceive, whose name is Ehiye, translated in the authorized version of the Bible as I am, or more explicitly, the self-existing one pure being. But these words are words, and nothing more unless they convey an impression to the mind and in themselves they cannot do that. They must be related to other ideas before they have any significance. We only begin to understand Kether when we study Chokma, the second Sephira, its emanation. It is only when we see the full unfoldment of the ten Sephiroth that we are ready to approach Kether, and then we approach it with the data that gives us the key to its nature. In working with the tree, it is wisest to keep on going over it rather than to concentrate upon a single point until it is mastered, for one thing explains another, and it is out of the perception of the relationships between the different symbols that enlightenment arises. Again we say the tree is a method of using the mind, not a system of knowledge. But at the moment we are not engaged in the study of emanations, but of origins so far as the human mind may hope to penetrate them, and paradoxical as it may appear, we shall penetrate further than we draw the veils across them than when we try to pierce the darkness. We will then sum up the position of Kether in one sentence, a sentence that can have but little significance for the student approaching the subject for the first time, but which must be borne in mind for its significance will begin to draw on presently. In so doing, we are adhering to the ancient esoteric tradition of giving the student a symbol to incubate till it hatches in his mind, rather than explicit instructions which would convey nothing to him. The seed sentence, then, which we cast into the subconscious mind of the reader or listener is this, Kether is the Malkuth of the unmanifest. Mather says, The limitless ocean of negative light does not proceed from a center, for it is centerless, but it concentrates a center from which the number one of the manifested Sephiroth, Kether, the crown, the first Sephira. These words in themselves contain contradictions and are unthinkable negative. Light is simply a way of saying that the thing is described, though having certain qualities in common with light is nevertheless not light as we know it. This tells us very little about that which is intended to describe. We are told not to make the mistake of thinking of it as light, but we are not told how to think of it as it really is, and for the very good reason that the mind is not equipped with any images under which to represent it, and must therefore let it alone till growth takes place. Nevertheless, although these words do not tell us all that we would like to know, they convey certain images to the imagination. These sink into the subconscious mind, and thence are evoked when ideas enter the conscious mind which are related to them. Thus knowledge grows from more and more to the Kabbalistic method is given its practical application as the yoga of the West. The Kabbalist recognizes four planes of manifestation and three planes of unmanifestation or negative existence. The first of those is called Ayin, the negativity, the second and sof, limitless, the third or and sof, the limitless light. It is out of this last that Kether is concentrated. These three terms are called the three veils of negative existence, depending back from Kether, 
In other words, they are the algebraic symbols that enable us to think of that which transcends thought and which at the same time hide which they represent and are the masks of transcendent realities. If we think of the states of negative existence in terms of anything that we know, we shall err for whatever else they may be. They cannot be that being unmanifest. The expression veils therefore teaches us to use these ideas as counters of no value in themselves, but useful to us in our calculations. This is the true use of all symbols. They veil that which they represent until we can reduce them to terms which we can comprehend. Nevertheless, they enable us to use in our calculations ideas which would otherwise be unthinkable and as the essence of the tree of life in the fact that it causes its symbols to elucidate one another by means of their relative positions. These veils serve as the scaffolding of thought, enabling us to take our bearings in regions as yet uncharted. Such veils or non-concrete symbols are, however, of no value to us unless one side of the veil abuts upon the known country. These three veils, Ayin, Ensof, and Orensof, negativity, the limitless, the limitless light, though we cannot hope to understand them, nevertheless suggest to our minds certain ideas, negativity implies being or existence of a nature which we cannot comprehend. We cannot conceive of a thing which is and yet is not. Therefore, we must conceive of a form of being of which we have never had any conscious experience, a form of being which according to our concepts of existence does not exist. And yet if one may express it so, exists according to its own idea of existence. So Dion Fortune goes through many other descriptions talking about the three supernals, the patterns of the tree, the ten sephiroth in the four worlds, the paths upon the tree, the subjective sephiroth, the gods upon the tree, and the practical work upon the tree. I can definitely talk about these in future episodes. I'm not quite sure how this will be uh, taken by my podcast audience because a lot of this is very hard to understand. The point of it is the tree of life, the Kabbalah, the symbol itself is what our soul looks like. And it's not necessarily the visual aspect of it, but the connections and relationships between the forces. So when you see the different connections and understanding these symbols over time, you grow with greater understanding of what they mean. You start to understand their meaning through their associations, not by themselves. So it's a long-term process of kind of just observing the different relationships, the patterns of the tree, the paths of the tree from one to another and how they relate. This is an ongoing process and I could definitely go deeper if you would like me to. But this kind of gives you a very introductory lesson on the Kabbalah, what it is and why it is important. And if it's something that entices you, you should check out the mystical Kabbalah or let me know. And, um, if I see enough comments, I'll definitely explore this topic further. If people are interested in the Kabbalah and the associations of the Kabbalah and what it means for there's practical work that we can do upon the Kabbalah and that stuff is also discussed in this book. The, the Kether, the Chakma, the Bina, the Chesed, the Gebura, they all have meaning in what they mean. And you could talk about this for hours and hours. It's so fascinating and interesting. So we will definitely explore this further if this is something you're interested in. It is an advanced teaching of a very ancient idea. And the point is when you come to this, it may be so hard to understand that a lot of times you're just going to walk away from it. You're not supposed to understand it. The symbols, the symbol itself, the relationships evoke some sort of subconscious learning that occurs that starts to come up over time. And that is the process. Uh, contemplation and meditation of this symbol can bring about a better understanding of your soul. If anybody has some personal experience of exercises, ideas, and philosophies around the tree of life, please put them in the comments. Teach me. I want to understand. It is such a difficult thing for me to understand. There are parts of this book 
that are so dense once she starts going into the relationships and I don't understand and I want to understand and anytime we try to simplify it it takes away how to learn from it it's very much like how do I explain physics to my cat there's a very complicated understanding that comes from the mystical Kabbalah but we are put in a position we will not ever truly understand it by the limitations of our human minds but it's a starting point how do you explain to my cat what physics is there's probably a starting point I can show him the earth I can start to show him symbols and so that's where we're at we're kind of at this very low point in understanding and this symbol helps us to understand these relationships I don't understand my hand is up please teacher teach me I'm only digesting and redigesting and is bringing back what I've learned from this and reading some of the key highlights of this book there are certainly many other books and we may look into the Mathers book as well but at any case thank you so much for sharing this learning with me and perhaps together we can learn more if it's important if I'm guided to it in any case all episodes of the reality revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the Reality Revolution.